Let's bow our head and pray. Lord, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, grant that the light of your love for us will help us become lights in the lives of those around us. Prepare our hearts for the joy and gladness of your coming. For Jesus is our, our hope. Amen. How many of you have put up your Christmas tree? I see a bunch of hands. <laughs> Sometime when you have an opportunity, a free minute, look up some of the history of the Christmas tree. One of the things we want to remind you of right now, though, there's a song I like to do the first Sunday in December, and you've heard it before. It's titled, The Perfect Tree. And this song reminds us that when we put up our Christmas tree, that we should remember another tree, the one that Jesus died on for us. So if you'll listen to The Perfect Tree. has been prepared strings of lights and holly are draped across the chairs the family's all together I know where they must be everyone is searching for the perfect tree the perfect tree grew very long ago and it was not decked with silver or with ornaments of gold but hanging from its branches was a gift for you and me Jesus laid his life down on the perfect tree Mother wants a straight one, the children want it tall. Dad just hopes that somehow he can get it down the hall. And soon they'll gather round it, as proud as they can be. But when they're looking at it, I wonder if they see. Perfect tree grew very long ago, and it was not decked with silver or with ornaments of gold, but hanging from its branches was a gift for you and me. Jesus laid his life down on the perfect. With all the celebrations, sometimes the truth is lost. And every step this baby took brought him closer to the cross. The perfect tree grew very long ago. And it was not death with silver. Gold, but hanging from its branches was a gift for you and me. Jesus laid his life down on the perfect tree, grew very long ago, and it was not decked with silver or with ornaments of gold. was a gift for you and me. Jesus laid his life down on a perfect tree.
but I know you're familiar with. This is one of those that you have to stand to be able to sing, though. You're going to have to have lots of air for the, choria, the chorus when we sing Gloria, and we hold it this long. So if you'll stand, help us as we sing Angels We Have Heard on High. Let us pray. Our dear God, we just come to you today and we just thank you for this day and we just thank you for this time that we have to assemble together and just worship you and just praise your name. We just thank you now for all the gifts and all the things that you do for us and we just pray that we will give it back with a loving heart and a caring heart and following your instructions, dear God. And we just pray that it will be used wisely. Just be with us as we continue through this service. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
What a wonderful time of worship this morning. Thank you so much for the music. Thank you so much for uh, participating uh, in our time of worship and in our songs this morning. There's uh, one thing that you, you certainly hear when uh, Christmas time rolls around and we begin to sing those, those Christmas carols and things of that nature. Uh, even y'all, the folks out there who say we don't sing very well, y'all like to sing that stuff anyway, don't you? Uh, I mean, I, I, I think I've seen Ken up there. He just kind of stopped for a moment and listened, and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm doing the same thing, you know. Uh, there is just something about Christmas that, uh, 
that just kind of gets us all in a good mood. And I don't know about you guys, but, but I'm, I'm ready for Christmas. You know, it, it's that time of the year. I, I, I hope that it gets cold. You know, I'm not necessarily worried about any snow or anything like that. But, I, you know, cold weather, Christmas time, winter time, I, I, that's what it's supposed to be this time of year. And so getting ready for Christmas and the idea of what Christmas is really all about, that, that's, that's the direction I'm headed. That's what I want to see. Now, we, we all get caught up with the, the modern idea of, of of Christmas and, and the shopping and the toys and, and all of those things. And, and uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but, but uh, if you got up or, you know, at 4 or 5 o'clock or if you left nowadays, you don't even have to get up early. You just go on, you know, uh, Thursday afternoon and went shopping and spent 10 or 12 hours. You know, if you did all of that, more power to you, you know. Uh, what I love being able to do is pick up my iPad at the house and sit there on my couch and go online and order it. You know, that's so much easier, you know. I didn't stand in line for not one thing, you know. Uh, but that's just kind of how that goes as well. Uh, but this morning, uh, man, I, I want to just talk about what Christmas is. What is the real Christmas? And so we're going to look at that for a few moments this morning, and we're going to start off with Matthew, and, and he's going to begin by telling us one of those amazing Christmas stories in Matthew chapter 2. I love the story of the wise men. I mean, I think it is, it is amazing. Uh, we have in our church here, my first Christmas here, of course, man, we have a beautiful uh, manger scene that this church has. And those, those wise guys are standing over there. And I mean, that's, it's amazing to see that. And, and uh, just a little side note, because I'm not going to mention names because I don't know who all helped, but for whoever does our decorating and putting all those things together for Christmas and, and really other events, I'm sure as well, y'all do a great job. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And to, to think about what Christmas truly is and, and within our church and our church family, uh, that is truly a blessing today. So I'm going to read to you this morning Matthew chapter 2. We're going to look at that story of the wise men beginning with that first verse and uh, going through verse 12. It said, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes and the people and he asked them where the Christ would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not by, me, nor by no means least among the rulers of Judea, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd the people of Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star that they had seen in its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above a place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in the dream not to go back to Herod till they return to their own country by another route. Pray with me this morning. Oh, Father, what a blessing it is to see this one of many, Father, stories of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, of all the ways that, Father, we may be able to look at this and all the things that we may glean from your word, Father. I just pray that, that this morning, for a few moments, Father, share and speak through me, Father, that my words may be your words and, and my thoughts may be your thoughts, Father, that you may just touch all of our hearts and lives and draw us closer to you. 
Thank you, O oh Father, for this day and our time together. Take care of us. Forgive us of our sins. Father, lead and guide us to be everything you would have us to be. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What is Christmas? You know, when we really look around at the world today, we see so many things that Christmas isn't. And I'm not going to get into the, the details of all of those things. And some of them may be good. Some of them may not be good. And the commercial aspect of Christmas that, that starts, you know, a month ago and all of those things. But let's just take a moment at God's Word and see what Christmas really is. I want to start by telling you this. Christmas is and needs to be and even has to be a time of rejoicing. A time of rejoicing. It says in Matthew, again, chapter 2, you see the text there, or there's a verse there, chapter 2, verse 10, that when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Man, I tell you what, there, the, t today, in this world in which we live in, there's a lot of things that we don't find joy in. There's a lot of things happening in the world around us that are not joyful moments. There's a lot of things that are happening in the world around us that are actually kind of scary, that are actually kind of dangerous, that are actually kind of, of overwhelming. And when you and I have the opportunity to encounter those joyous moments in our hearts, those joyous moments in our lives, oh, what a blessing it is. You know, we don't, know, we don't really know the background of these three wise men. We don't know the background of what they had gone through before. But all we do know is that they saw a star. And when they saw that star, it led them on a journey. And when they saw that star in Bethlehem again, they were overwhelmed with joy. They were overwhelmed with joy because they realized that the journey that they had been on, they had found what they were looking for. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you this. Oh, how much we may rejoice in the idea that we can find what we're looking for through one and only one. His name is Jesus. Man, what a blessing it is to know that. Man, we live in a world where people are searching for all kinds of things. They're definitely trying, trying to find some joy in their life, trying to rejoice in their life, trying to have those moments in their life. And they look out into the world and they look out into all of these other things. But you and I know that it's Jesus. It's Jesus that sets us apart. It's Jesus that brings us through those difficult moments. It's Jesus that gives us what we need when we need it. And you and I, especially of this time of the year, but dare I say all times of the year, we ought to be rejoicing of what Jesus Christ is doing in our hearts, rejoicing of what Jesus Christ is doing in our lives. When everything else doesn't look like it's supposed to, Jesus has a way. And he has a way. This old star that was there, it was over the city of, of Bethlehem, not over the city of Jerusalem, not over a great uh, castle or anything of that nature. It was over a lowly manger. Actually here, shall I say, a, a home by that time. Oh, what, a, what an amazing moment it had to be to know and to rejoice of all the wonderful things that's out there in the world. Christmas is that time of rejoicing for all mankind. Man, I look at our, our songs this morning, those, those beautiful Christmas carols, there are, there are songs of rejoicing. I think about the things in my life that even as a small child, the moments in my life that I remember those special toys or those special times that I've had, man, it's a time of rejoicing. I think about as a young parent, uh, seeing my children for the very first time really get what Christmas is all about. Man, that's a time of rejoicing. I see it even now as a, as a grandparent to see my grandchildren, to know that my oldest is now a child of God and that he understands what Christmas really is. He understands the idea and can rejoice over the idea and fact that Jesus is his Lord and his Savior. And I know that you feel the same way for your family and your children and your grandchildren to rejoice in the fact, to know in the fact that the truth of Christmas, that God became a man 
and live so that you and I may live. Died so that you and I may live. Rose again so that you and I may live. And we can rejoice in that today. Christmas is a time of rejoicing. But not only a time of rejoicing, Christmas is also a, a time for family. It says there, and again, verse 11, that they entered the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. I, I think about that verse and that scene in my mind, and I can, oh, just to imagine what that must have been like. To go to that home and, you know, as put in it kind of like what we would do to, to knock on the door. To knock on the door with anticipation to, of, of who would answer that door with anticipation of, of all the things, of all the times that they've traveled. You know, history tells us that Jesus probably by this time may have been two years old, something like that. So these guys, these wise men who saw this star for over two years, they've been traveling, they've been looking, they've been desiring to find that amazing time, that amazing place, that king of kings kings, that Lord of lords. And can you imagine when they knock on that door? Here it is. Here's the moment. Here's the event. I kind of picture it this way, even though it's not biblical, okay, but I, I kind of picture it this way. I picture maybe Mary going and kind of, kind of cracking the door a little bit and saying, who is it? In that southern slang that I'm sure she had, okay. Who's there? Just three old wise men. I don't know how they responded, honestly. But somehow or another, they, they talked Mary into opening that door. And as they opened that door, this little two, three-year-old, whatever age he may have exactly been, little boy, I picture him running around and grabbing Mama by the leg and looking up and saying, who are these guys, you know? thinking that anyway. And I see these wise men bowing in worship. Man, Christmas, it is a time for family. A time when we get back to our family and understand that this time of rejoicing, this time of family, this time of of all of these opportunities and things that we have, man, it is a way to, to just envelop and, and be enveloped by the love and by the grace and by the mercy of Jesus Christ. It is a time of family. You know, as I get older, and I dare say maybe some of you who are a little older would understand this, as I get older, those moments when all of our family are together together, you really begin to cherish those moments. Because you also understand that in every family, as the years go by, sometimes there are those who are no longer with you. And as we get a little older, sometimes that seems to happen more often. These wise men probably had no idea when they knocked on the door that Jesus would one day hang on a cross, that one day he would leave his mother behind as he followed his father and accomplished his will. Man, what a blessing. Family. I want to encourage you to do something this year. I want to encourage you to make sure that your family, your time of worship, your time of celebration, your time of Christmas, that it is a time for your family to come together. And if there's stuff going on in your family, if there's difficulties in your family, pray about that and try to work that out. I, I, and, and I'm saying all that this morning because nobody has said a word to me, okay? I don't know any of you well enough in the background of most of you well enough to make that statement other than just a blanket statement that if there's stuff going on in your family, work it out. It's not worth it. It's not worth going through all of that without each other. 
It's not worth being mad or being angry or being upset. As a pastor, I've witnessed that. I have seen that. I don't have a perfect family, but Lord, thank you, Jesus. We are still able to get together and celebrate Christmas and Thanksgiving and all of those things. You need to as well. Christmas is a time for family. It's a time for your earthly family. It is a time for your church family. Men, come and celebrate together. Come and worship together. Come and be all that Jesus Christ would have you to be for your family together. Man, there are so many out there who are struggling, so many out there who are missing out, so many out there who are not together. We've got, we've got military personnel around the world. They didn't spend Thanksgiving with their family. They're going to be gone for Christmas. We have people that put their life on the line. They've, you know, Christmas Day is going to roll around. There's going to be somebody at the hospital, Lord willing, right, working. And the fire department and the police and all those other places. Family. Don't let anything get in the way of family. Christmas is a time for family. A time for rejoicing, a time for family a time for worship. Again, verse 11, entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshiped him. Then they opened treasures and presented him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Here's what I do when I see a new baby. <laughs> Gucci, Gucci, Gucci. You know, something like that, right? We make these weird noises, you know, and I'm thinking the baby somewhere, and I'm just, you know, praise the Lord, they don't remember that stuff three or four years later, you know. I, I don't think they do anyway. I don't remember that. But, I mean, we make all of these weird noises, and yet the wise men, the very first time they saw a small child, the Bible says they fell to their knees and worshiped. Worship. Christmas is a time for worship. Ladies and gentlemen, as a believer in Christ, there are two holidays that I think sets, sets us into the aspect of where we need to go. The first one is Christmas. For without the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Easter would not have happened. So Christmas puts all of this in motion. Christmas is that moment in time, that perfect moment in time when God said, now is the time for you to be born. Now is the time for you to go and save the world. Now is the time for you to sacrifice yourself on a cross for the sins of all mankind. And Jesus did just that. And we celebrate his birth. I'll be honest. Did it happen on December the 25th? More than likely, that is not true. It really doesn't matter, okay? But what does matter is that we celebrate His birth, that we celebrate His life, that we worship Him as the Lord and Savior of this world. And oh, what a special time Christmas is. It gives us an opportunity to worship. It gives us an opportunity to praise His name. It gives us an opportunity to do things that, that, that we need to do, that we need to celebrate, that we need to move forward with. You know, we need to do these things because Jesus Christ loves us in that, such an, an amazing, overwhelming way. What a blessing. Christmas is a time for worship. Christmas is also a time for giving. It says they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. You see, some may think that the idea of giving began with the wise men. It didn't. 
The first gift of Christmas was not the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh that the wise men gave. The first gift of Christmas was the birth of Jesus. God gave us His Son. His Son was born into this world. That's the first gift of Christmas. Mankind didn't start the gift giving. God started the gift giving. The gold was symbolic of the purity and royalty of his life. The myrrh was a costly ornament, ointment there, excuse me, associated with times of bitterness and suffering and hardship, even death. The frankincense was a, a fragrance used in anointing to dead. They were, were practical gifts, I guess you would say, in some form or fashion, but they were also gifts that could be sold for a price. These are probably the gifts that were sold that funded their trip into Egypt for lasted for a few years. Christmas has always been a time for giving. And as Ken sang a song about a Christmas tree earlier, the greatest Christmas gift of all Jesus gave to us, not on Christmas Day, but on Easter, on Good Friday, as he gave his life on a cross and fulfilled that gift on an Easter Sunday morning as he rose again. Christmas is a time for giving. There are so many out there who still don't get it. So many out there who still don't put things into perspective the way they should. They don't rejoice or they don't celebrate family and they don't worship our Lord. They don't give the way that they should give to others. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, let's think about it. You and I, we live in the most blessed land in the world. And the opportunity and, and the ability to give what we have is something that shouldn't be something that, that, that shouldn't be hard for us. It was be, should be something that because of the blessings of God, we just desire to give. And there are those who struggle with that, struggle with who God is and struggle with what's real and what's not. I want to tell you a story. It's not a Tim McCaffrey story of, at all. It's a, a Paul Harvey story. And uh, I look around this morning and there's a good group of folks in here who know who Paul Harvey is, but there's probably a younger generation, sadly, who may never hear some of the stories of Paul Harvey. And they're going to miss out on a guy who knew how to tell a story. And usually those stories carried with it a wonderful lesson of life. Well, this story... Christmas story of Paul Harvey's is titled The Man and the Birds. He says and writes, The man to whom I'm going to introduce to you is not a Scrooge. He was a kind, decent, mostly good man. Generous to his family, upright in his dealings with other men, but he just didn't believe all that incarnation stuff that the church proclaimed at Christmas time. It just didn't make much sense, and he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He just couldn't swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. I'm truly sorry to distress you, he told his wife, but I'm not going to church with you this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, that he'd much rather just stay at home, and that he'd wake up for them, and so he stayed, and they went to the nighttime service. Shortly after the family drove away in the car, the snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier and then went back to his fireside chair and began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by thudding sound and then another and, and another. Sort of a thump or a thud at first, he thought. Someone must be throwing snowballs against his living room window. But when he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled miserably in the snow. 
They had been caught in the storm and in a desperate search for shelter, they had tried to fly through this large landscape window. Well, he couldn't let the poor creatures just lie there and freeze, so he remembered the barn, of course. His children stabled their pony there, and that would provide a, a warm shelter if he could direct the birds to it. So quickly he put on a coat and his shoes and trampled through the deep snow and headed toward the barn. He, he opened the doors wide and turned on the light, but the birds did not come in. He figured that food would entice them, so he hurried back to the house fetching breadcrumbs and sprinkled them on the snow, making a trail to the yellow-lighted, yellow wide-open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs and continued to just flap around helplessly in the snow. He tried to catch them. He tried shooing them in the barn by walking around them and waving his arms. And scared, they scattered in every direction except into the warm lighted barn. And then he realized that they were afraid of him. To them, he reasoned, I am a strange and terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me, then I'm not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? Because any move that he made tended to frighten them, to confuse them. They would just not follow him. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. He said, if only I could be a bird and mingle with them and speak their language. Then I could tell them not to be afraid. I could show them the way to safe, warm, the safe, warm barn and for all this to happen, I would have to be one of them so that they could see and hear and understand. And at that very moment, the church bells began to ring. And the sound of those bells reached his ear. And as he stood there listening to those bells, it hit him. The only way that you and I could ever comprehend and imagine who God really is was for Jesus to come to this world as a man, to live a perfect life, sinless life, to die on a cross for our sins. That was the only way that you and I would ever figure out who God really is. And ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what happened. That's what Christmas is. Jesus left heaven so that you and I may know him. Do you know him this morning? What better time would there be than the Christmas time of the year than to make sure your heart is right with Jesus? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this morning and our time together, for all the blessings, Father, that you give to us and everything that we do, Father, and everything that we say. We are truly blessed beyond measure. Father, thank you for this day and all the ways that you touch our lives. Lead and guide us, Father, as only you can. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing with me.